Insurance is an interesting piece of the of the space world. It's um, it's inevitably it's a it's a major cost for those who who buy insurance uh, for space activity. But as a as a bottom line up front, if you will, um, insurance is a you can think of it as a financial first responder. You can think of it as as unlocking economic potential and and um, enabling innovation and investment. So without insurance, you would have, <coughs> excuse me, in the space world, you would have uh, much less and maybe no innovation uh, or investment because there would be no protection for the inevitable things that go wrong. So uh, I've been in uh, the in space insurance business for 35 years. Um, I'm not a uh, recovering uh, astrophysicist. I'm a recovering French literature major. <laughs> but I did go to the same uh, university as, uh, as Mark at uh, UC Santa Cruz, uh, where I did study French literature. But I've also been a pilot, I've been a musician, I've done a lot of different things, um, and that's kind of led me to where, where I am today, uh, running the space insurance uh, group at AXA XL. AXA is a huge company, 120,000 people, 150 billion in revenue. Um, they bought XL, uh, a small insurance company, last September, and um, so we're sort of a bolt-on company to them. We've maintained, for my group, we've maintained our U.S. domicile so that we can continue to do some, some very important work with the U.S. government. Um, the, uh, we are, uh, uh, as, as Mark alluded to, we're the proud insurer of Planet um, and their satellite launches and uh, satellites uh, on orbit. We've done a lot of work in the in the new space world, the small sat world. We're the, by far the leading insurer of small satellites, small launch vehicles, new space activities, space platforms, what have you, as well as our work in, in traditional big geo platforms and the like. <coughs> but in the small sat world, we have uh, over a 90% market share. And why is that? That's because we get out there and we're advocates and, and, um, and we engage in outreach with the new space community to really make sure we understand the risks that they face and help them with things like innovation and investment. Um, the, uh, we're, we're, we're an insurance company, right? So we issue the insurance policy, we take the premium in, we pay the claims when they happen. So we are the, that, that backstop, if you will. Between us and a typical client would be an insurance broker, and Rob Shiga, who's over here, um, is uh, an insurance broker. He's, he's basically the agent for the, the client. So he's in fact uh, the agent for, uh, for Planet. Uh, work with uh, Rob a lot on, on the Planet account as well as many others. The, um, the, the question, that, the issue that I've been asked to address is liability for bad things in space, but also can insurance be somehow used as an incentive for good behavior. So let's back up and say what's good behavior and who's doing what. So there, uh, we, we did a sort of a, an analysis of all the organizations that claim to be doing good work efforts in responsible space activity. And we found over 50 organizations um, around the world <coughs> that are working on responsible space activity. Everyone from the UN COPUS and World Economic Forum down to you know um, industry groups, uh, trade associations, and what have you. There are a lot of organizations. So the Venn diagram of responsible space activity efforts is very large, very complicated, and definitely they don't. All the circles do not overlap. So the 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 the, the largest junction of responsible space activity is actually a very small uh, space. We, we would like to see more coordination, more cooperation among the organizations that are looking at it. Responsible space activity is going to be critical, not just from our point of view because we don't want to pay claims, but because um, uh, as uh, I forget what, who said it, but uh, you know, people talk about this tragedy of the commons, if there's a bad day in space and there's effectively pollution of major important orbits that could really affect uh, not just communications and Earth observation, but uh, PNT, position, navigation, and timing, 
and other uh, things that, that, that our world relies on every single day. So there was a little bit of a discussion about regulation. Should there be you know, best practices or standards or regulation? And that's sort of the continuum of, of the strength of it. Best practices, great. Everyone should use best practices. Standards are official cataloged rules that people can go to. Regulation is the far end of that spectrum, and that says you must. Um, even though the US has the most developed regulatory environment, as was pointed out, one, it's changing with the uh, very strong push towards uh, regulatory reform uh, in space. Two, um, we should be the leaders. We should be the world leaders in, in regulation. We're often not, but we really should be. And, and three, people don't like regulation when they're trying to do things in a very innovative and agile manner. Regulation can get in the way. It simply can. And that was, that's one of the reasons why there's this very strong push now towards regulatory reform here uh, in, in the space world. Some of the things that we look at as an insurance company, some of the tools that we would like to see implemented are, and, and these are, uh, as Mark said, he was speaking for himself. I'm speaking for myself, but I am speaking as a representative of AXA XL. There are certain technologies that would be simple to implement and would be very helpful in making sure that space activity is done responsibly. <coughs> we believe that there should be beacons on every satellite. Mm -hmm. Every satellite should have a beacon. Mm -hmm. It's small, it's the size of a post-it note and self-powered and it just needs to transmit every 10 minutes or half hour or what have you. Um, it's very simple to do. There are some organizations and some enterprises that are working on beacons. Um, cameras, we believe there should be cameras on launch vehicles, and a lot of launch vehicles these days do have cameras. Um, there should also be cameras on complex satellites to, um, to, look at, to be able to look at deployments. Cameras take power, mass, uh, bandwidth, and all that, but cameras have, um, have proven very useful in a number of cases. And then maybe most importantly, um, and Mark alluded to this with, with the planet constellation. Most of their satellites are in the four or 500 kilometer uh, altitude. Um, our feeling is if you're above, say, 600 kilometers, you should have propulsion on your satellite. You, I wouldn't say you must, but I would say you probably must. Um, <laughs> and uh, because, because if you're above 600 or 650 kilometers, you are not going to come down very quickly at all. You're just going to be there for a long time. Propulsion, again, takes mass, takes power, takes, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's expensive. But there are cheap solutions and they don't need to be able to get your satellite out of orbit in five minutes or five hours or five days even. If it gets it out of orbit in five years, that's perfectly adequate for the standards that the U.S. has implemented. Um, but we feel that beacons, cameras, and propulsion are absolutely key technologies that satellites should have. Um, and <coughs> I believe that, again, from the point of view of leadership, if organizations start using any of those technologies, they will, um, others will be convinced to do the same. So from a leadership point of view, I think Companies like Planet, like other um, uh, well-thinking, forward-thinking companies in, in space, um, I think that those are the models we should follow. Incentivizing good behavior. Well, everyone wants a good driver discount, right? Everyone wants a good driver discount. The, the notion of insurance is, though, <coughs> that everyone pays into the pot, and those few that have the claims take out of the pot. So what inevitably happens is, even though you've never had a car accident, that doesn't mean you pay zero for your insurance premium. Even though you've had an accident, doesn't mean you pay 100%. There's a compression of pricing. I, I like to tell the story, although my daughter doesn't like it when I tell it, 
that when she got her driver's license, she had three accidents in four months, <laughs> <laughs> including uh, one total loss and two partial losses. So, of course, I mean, she should have been paying several hundred percent in insurance premiums. <laughs> of course, being her dad, I paid it. <laughs> she was 17 or whatever. Um, but, but, of course, my premiums didn't skyrocket as much as they should have if I was being charged the technical amount that I have cost the insurance industry because everyone pays in <coughs> for those who take out. There's this compression of pricing. So the best risks pay too much according to their technical failure rate and the worst risks pay too little. Nonetheless, it's a pooling of, pooling of risk. <coughs> so, excuse me. Um, let me talk a little bit about types of insurance because it's very important to understand that when we talk about space insurance, there are two types of insurance that are very often conflated and we've actually run into some very serious issues on some very <coughs> big government programs because people didn't realize there was a difference between the two. The first type and the type that I spend 95% of my time on is asset insurance. Just paying for or insuring against the failure of a launch vehicle, the failure of a satellite, some sort of failure during the uh, preparation for launch, the launch itself, the operation of the satellite in space that causes damage to an asset and the organization whose asset that <coughs> has, you know, the, uh, has that asset, they want to um, replace that asset. So that is your typical, it's like collision coverage on your car. Um, we pay for total losses, we pay for partial losses, but if the rocket blows up or the satellite up in space fails, uh, we pay. And we pay typically to replace it or, or for the book value of the asset. It's important to understand that our policy is an all risks policy. Your homeowner's policy covers 10 named perils and only those named perils, fire, windstorm, whatever. Our policies are almost the opposite. We pay for everything except those few things that are excluded and as all insurance company, uh, all insurance policies do, we exclude war, we exclude nuclear, we exclude terrorism. Virtually <laughs> everything else is insured. So we insure against a rocket blowing up. We insure against a satellite failing for any reason, a solar flare, a meteoroid, uh, somebody left a rag in a, in a fuel line. I mean, we've, we've seen it all. I'm, it's sort of like that farmer's insurance ad that you may have seen on TV, those, those farmer's insurance ads. Yeah, we've seen it all. And we really have. We've seen some very funny and very amusing and very silly things happen in space that, that have cost us a lot of money. That's okay. That's what we're here for. We embrace risk. We take risk. We're paid to take risk. We're an insurance company. We're paid to take risk. We don't mind risk. We don't avoid it. So that's the asset insurance. And that, when you hear about space insurance, when a rocket blows up or a satellite fails and you read about insurance in space news or CNN or what have you, that's the type of insurance that they're talking about. <coughs> the other type of insurance, which is really the domain of what we're talking about today, is liability insurance. So liability insurance, in general, pays for bodily injury or property damage to unrelated third parties, okay? So if a rocket blasts off and it falls on Cocoa Beach uh, on July 4th while everyone's watching the fireworks and, and injures people or damages property, the liability insurance policy will, will pay for that, will indemnify for that. The, um, the FAA, which issues launch licenses for U.S. launches, requires that uh, launch companies buy or show evidence of, of financial um, strength up to what's called the maximum probable loss, the MPL. So the, whether it's ULA or SpaceX or Orbit, uh, Northrop or whomever, they have to buy insurance to, to cover losses to third parties, to unrelated third parties, bodily injury, property damage. <coughs> Above the MPL, there's a regime in place where the government would indemnify for any losses above that. And the, the highest MPLs out today are about close to 300 million, um, but they could be as high as 500 million. And above that, there's um, a roughly two or three billion of, of government appropriation that would pay for losses beyond that 500 million or 300 million. Um, and above the uh, government um, uh, regime, then it's on back on the uh, launch provider again. 
in return for forcing them to buy that insurance to protect unrelated third parties, the, um, the government requires that everyone involved in the launch essentially hold each other harmless and, and agree not to sue anyone in the chain all the way from the launch vehicle operator down to the person who's pr providing the screws to screw on a, a piece of uh, hardware onto the rocket, all the way down that chain. The provider of the propulsion system, the pro provider of the uh, uh, attitude control, what have you, the satellite operator themselves, everyone agrees to not sue each other if there's a problem um, that results in a third party loss, uh, bodily injury, property damage to uh, unrelated third parties. So again, asset insurance is what you hear about most. Liability insurance is what we really need to talk about here today. So I like to describe space as a, essentially a no fault regime. If there's a collision in space, yes, indeed, the, the Outer Space Treaty and the Liability Convention say that the responsibility for third party damage is on the nation state from which the object was launched. So if you have a Russian rocket that's <coughs> launched from Kazakhstan, carrying a French built satellite for a US client um, and uh, the uh, or US operator and the, uh, the operator is going to lease capacity to uh, a UK company or something like that. With all those countries involved, ultimately it comes down to the nation state from which it was launched, which would be Kazakhstan, except that Russia takes responsibility for launches from Kazakhstan. So, however, that's never been tested fully, and there are plenty of attorneys in the room who know a lot more about this than I do, but um, the, uh, the Iridium Cosmos collision, for example, um, where two satellites collided, one owned by the US company Iridium, one a defunct uh, Russian military satellite, actually Soviet military, I believe it was Soviet military satellite. They collided and created a, a huge amount of debris, most of which is still up there. Um, well, it turns out both of those satellites were actually launched from Russia. So um, it would not obviously have made sense for Russia to sue Russia or anything like that. Everyone basically agreed, look, it was unanticipated. Um, we didn't realize it would happen. But it was the precursor to what will inevitably happen. There will be collisions in space. I forget who was making the comment or asking the question before, but there will be collisions in space, and there will be serious collisions in space, and a lot of debris will be created. Um, the, the regime is untested. It's old. It comes from the days when it was only nation states who participated in space activity. So what can we do about it? First of all, since I have the uh, stage, I will say one of my big issues is you'll hear people talk about debris, about space debris, okay, and the debris risk. Debris is only one part of what's up there. And if you're a satellite operator, debris is someone else's problem. So what I would like to do is I'd like to change the lexicon and instead of calling it debris risk, call it collision risk because collision risk is everyone's problem, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so one, let's call it collision risk and let's recognize that collisions will happen and debris will be created and debris will affect other satellites that are up there. But it's the collision risk that we need to, to pay attention to. So what do we do about that that possibility of collision. Well, uh, there was talk about space situational awareness, space traffic management, and I'm sure we'll hear at lunch today from uh, Kevin about uh, about what the Department of Commerce is doing in that in that realm. Um, space situational awareness, knowing what is up there and where it is and what it's doing. Okay, uh, there are a lot of new systems that are coming online, both commercial and government, that will vastly increase the amount of information that we collect on, um, on space objects. Right now we can see things down to the size of roughly a softball or a golf ball, but pretty soon we're going to be able to see a lot uh, smaller objects, so we'll see a lot more of them. So 
So one of the big issues there is really the assimilation and analysis of the data. We're going to have a lot of data in the same way that Planet gets six terabytes a day. We're going to be getting a lot of data on, on space objects. So we need to know how to process it, to analyze it, to figure out what's important and what's not. Um, people think that the, the main risk is between big objects. And indeed, there is a lot of risk between uh, big objects. There's a fellow out, um, uh, Darren McKnight, who I'm sure many of you know, who has done a lot of analysis on collision potential between uh, spent Russian upper stages, basically two school bus size objects that mm -hmm. have in the past come within meters of each other. Um, two of those colliding would basically double the catalog, the, the catalog of tracked objects instantly. That would be very bad. So yes, big on big is bad, but what's, what's also bad is what's called lethal non-trackable objects. So small objects, maybe a centimeter or smaller, uh, moving at relative velocities, uh, uh, very high relative velocities, um, can cause a lot of damage. So these new systems, whether they're optical or radar or um, what have you that are coming online, will be able to track a lot of that previously lethal non-trackable debris. So that's great, but again, the issue is how do we take the data and analyze it and actually use it. So um, we talk about space situational awareness, then we talk about space traffic management. Space traffic management is making sure people know when they need to be doing things. If you carry that one step further, you could talk about space traffic control and the way we talk about air traffic control. Um, space traffic control will be very difficult to do because you have uh, you have no rules, you have different jurisdictions, and you have um, different agendas of the operators. Some want to uh, do their commercial business, others don't want to be seen, and what have you. So space traffic control is probably not going to happen in the near term. Space traffic management is the sort of hybrid between what we know and what people should be doing. It's a very difficult thing to implement, space traffic management. It's very easy to say, here's the data, and here's what, here's what you need to know about your object. Um, so I'll address a few of the things that Mark mentioned in his, uh, um, in his statements and in, in the Q&A that came off of that. Um, one of those was government activity in space, or I should say, does a space company like Planet need to have the government as an anchor customer? Well, there was an interesting conference uh, that Wayne Hale's company put on in January out in Boulder where that was the question. And, you know, the, the, the response was raised that, well, where do you draw the line? What's government activity and what's not government activity? If, if, if Planet is selling information for agriculture, that's great. And maybe some of that makes its way into the government. Maybe the government is even sponsoring farmers to use that data. Well, essentially there's government money involved in that. So to draw a circle around what's government activity is very difficult. On the ASAT test, indeed Planet was right out there with the first statement that that was a bad thing to do. And Planet is prob has probably launched more satellites on Indian launch vehicles than any other company, any other organization um, outside of India. And bravo to Planet for saying that was bad, even though they're uh, an anchor customer of the uh, Indian launch vehicle. Um, what was interesting in that was, indeed, the Indians, it was before the election, right before the election, it was during the conflict with Pakistan, the Indians wanted to show their capabilities. Well, within several days, China came out and said, oh, we are going to cooperate with Pakistan on space activity. Well, that's talk about unintended consequences. I mean, this is, this is um, pushing, pushing, uh, basically handing the Chinese uh, a, a reason to, to do that sort of thing. Now, of course, Pakistan already has several satellites that they've bought from China. so. Um, that was it was a natural thing, but it, it this these types of show off activities, these types of ASAT tests and, and the like, intentional collisions in space are are basically very bad. Um, 
In terms of the proliferation of capabilities, of analytical capability, the capability to analyze data, uh, whether it's SSA data or uh, electro-optical data or radar data from space, let's assume that the capabilities have already proliferated, export control or not. Let's assume that the Chinese are perfectly capable of, 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 um, of, of doing that. Um, so let me now get to the, the two questions that, uh, that were on the, on the list here, and then we can open it up for discussion. So what's the current state of liability laws and regulations concerning undesirable space conjunctions, let's say collisions? Um, um, the, the current state of liability laws is, is vague and untested. There, again, there are treaties that, that you know, were written in the, six, in the 60s and implemented in the 60s um, and 70s, but the, um, uh, they really have never been tested. So it's very difficult to say how something would be adjudicated. Again, it's a, essentially a no-fault regime in space um, unless somebody does something intentional. Um, how does insurance currently assign liability for damage from such conjunctions? Again, we look at it as, as no fault. We exclude war, we exclude terrorism, so if it's war or terrorism, it's not covered, but otherwise we, we pay the claim, whether it's on the asset side or if it were to happen on the liability side. So uh, hopefully I have kind of explained some of the, so the, the different types of insurance, the, the appetite for risk, um, the types of things that, that, that we look at, um, and um, oh, one, one other thing that we didn't talk about is on-orbit servicing, okay? On-orbit servicing is a wonderful idea whose time has come and it will be implemented very soon, like in the next year at least, maybe less. On-orbit servicing is very important because it allows uh, people to fix things that have gone wrong. Um, and there are a lot of organizations that are, that are looking at uh, on-orbit servicing. The issue with on-orbit servicing, the issues include standards. What are the standards? How close can you get to something that's cooperative? How close can you get to something that's, that's um, non-cooperative? How close can you get something to something that is uncooperative and, and is, is actually um, someone else's object that you're not supposed to be looking at? So on-orbit servicing has a lot of issues associated with it. There are some organizations here, we're part of one called CONFERS that's looking at on-orbit servicing and, and best <coughs> practices and standards. Um, so from a liability point of view though, what happens if the servicer damages the client satellite? Whether it's uh, during the approach or while they're connected or at some point, um, how, do, how, do you, how do you figure out who is really responsible for that? And basically what we tell our clients is make sure that your contracts are strong enough that you either waive liability or you assess it or you, 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 you draw very distinct circles around who's responsible for what. Let's not rely on the Outer Space Treaty or the Liability Convention to adjudicate uh, bad things that happen in space. Let's do it by contract and let's just be you know, sophisticated parties when it comes to dealing with this. So I think I'll stop there.